Christmas Eve. Here we are. The shopping malls, the wish lists, and the online deliveries are all but behind us. The Christmas cards, the outdoor lights, and the wrapped presents are ready. And here we are now on Christmas Eve. And God, we turn toward you because we need you. We need you to give us the vision to see this child more clearly than ever before. We need your spirit to help us experience him as grace and truth wrapped in humanity. Because in Jesus, you are displaying your love for the world. In him, you are proving your faithfulness to all generations, including ours. And here we are, God, surrendering, hoping, waiting, and leaning into the perfect love that our souls were created for. And we need you. So Father, please meet us here on this Christmas Eve. you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn over to Luke, the second chapter. Luke, the second chapter. We're going to be in verses 8 through 20 this morning. I don't know, have y'all ever been in a room where you can see the a kid's excitement about you wanting to see something. They are them wanting you to see something. The excitement of that. And look, look, or you, you, you know, some of you are, uh, may have personally experienced that mom, 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 mom. What? Hey, you know. Uh, dads, we're not as patient as moms are with that. Dad, dad I, you know. But kids, when they get excited about something, I, and, and we're going to go spend some time uh, with our family this afternoon, and eight grandchildren, and when you have eight, all of them want you to look at something right then. So you're like you're at a tennis match, and you're back and forth like this, and it's really super fast because... They're excited. Pops, pops, come see my new bed. Come see my new bed. I remember go up there and then and she's demolished it already from the night before. And she says, Look, this is my bed. And uh, they're so excited. Kids are so excited about you seeing something. And, they, and to them, it's the most important thing in the world. And they want to share it with us. They want to share it with you. Well, there, there are times that adults, we're in the same, the same uh, position. We want you to come see something. Come look at what we've done. You know, we, when we moved here back in 17, March of 17, you know, we wanted everybody. Come look. Come look at what we've done. Come look at what we have. So it's important. And there's an excitement there that uh, people want you to see things. They, it, 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 but in our scripture, we're going to see the same thing today. That there were those who were excited about, hey, hey uh, won't you just come and see? Won't you come and see? I want you to see something. It's exciting. There's something really great going on, and I want you to see it. I want you to be a part of it. So if you are, get uh, in your Bibles, the second chapter of Luke, if you will, join me there. And can you imagine uh, what it was like when, when God said to the shepherds, hey, come and see. Won't you come and see? And he invites them to come and see. So let's start in the eighth verse in the second chapter of Luke. And let's, let's read our text this morning, the eighth through the 20th verse. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Some of your text may say, among men. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up all things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Let's pray. God, thank you for this text. Thank you for this history. Thank you for inviting us to come and see. Come and see the Savior. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, there are three things I want you to see here. I made it easy. They all start with the letter P. So the first thing I want you to see here about this is, won't you come and see the present of Jesus? Won't you come and see the present of Jesus? Now, as the scripture said there, the shepherds are just minding their own business, just keeping watch over their flocks at night, doing what shepherds do, just hanging out out in the outside in the elements and doing what they're supposed to do. Shepherds don't usually tend flocks toward the end of the year as we know the calendar today. They, so they don't usually do that toward the end of the year. So what does that lead us to know? That, that the birth of Jesus was probably not December the 25th as we celebrate it. And there are some things, there are different thoughts on that and but what I want you to know, whether it's April, July, or September, the bottom line is Jesus was born. Jesus was born. And what did we talk about several weeks ago? We believe as Christians something significant happened in time that we believe what we believe. And here, really not the beginning of it, but kind of the beginning as we know it of being Jesus. The bottom line is he was born. Now the angel appears, appears to the shepherds out there. And, and you know, they were not like wise men. The wise men got a big star that they could follow. No, they, they, they didn't get a warning or anything. All of a sudden, as they're minding their own business, in the dead of night, now, I don't know how many of y'all have been out in the dead of night, maybe out in a field away from town, and it's dark. And I'm telling you, when you get out in the woods, you hear everything. And you probably believe you see some things. I'll never forget, one of our, uh, when our kids were younger, we used to go camping every spring, and it was usually around spring break. And our favorite um, place to go was over in the Smokies at Elkmont. And we'd go to the campground, <clears throat> but in the campground there, they, they, ha they have a public restroom, but you don't have electricity. You got a, a, a pump well that about six or eight sites share each, but it's quiet. And I remember that night, one night we were there, and Jennifer had taken the kids. I believe the first time we, uh, the first time Eli went, Eli was a year old, and uh, so Caitlin was about seven, and she had gotten the kids, and they, she went on in, and we had a fire going, and it's one of my favorite things to do is sit around a campfire, prop my, especially when it's cooler, and prop my feet up there. My feet gets warm, and I tend to, uh, I'll drink coffee at night or my favorite grape Kool-Aid and, and eat what I call those cheap Walmart VBS cream cookies. And, and if you grew up going to church, uh, now we get fancy with VBS snacks. When I went, you, you got two of them cream cookies and you got some, some Kool-Aid that uh, Miss Lottie or that old lady that you know that ran, uh, ran a lot of those VBS snack here, she, you gave two cookies and that was it. And you got a little cup of watered-down Kool-Aid. Uh, but it was still delicious. It's a, it's a great memory of church that I have. But I was sitting at the fire that night, 
And the kids and, and the quiet, the, the campground was quiet because you have to be, certainly have to be quiet after a certain time. But I'm sitting there and I had the radio on just barely where I could hear it. And I had my feet propped up and it was quiet and you could, you know, the fire's crackling and popping and there's smoke coming out, the smell of it. There's just something about that. And I'm sitting there and I'm about half asleep and I'm, I'm just waiting for the fire to go out and then I'm going to go get in the tent. And I'm sitting there and I'm about half awake and about that time three huge deer jumped directly over the fire right in front of me. A little, a little more of that Kool-Aid and I would have had an issue that evening. And I jumped, it just startled me. I was sitting there minding my own business, doing my own thing, watching the fire, protecting, make sure the fire didn't spread or anything like that. And all of a sudden, this big event happens with these three deer and they just kept going. And I'm sure they got over to the edge of the woods and stopped and turned around and looked and said, oh, we scared fat boy over there. Did you see that? Did you see his eyes? But anyway, so the shepherds are out there and all of a sudden they are face to face with an angel of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I might have gotten a little afraid. Look at verse 9 there. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. There's a Greek word here that when you translate it, it's like super scared is what it means. And I guess the closest we can probably get to it is terrified. And this happens and the, they appear to the shepherds and these guys are so terrified at what's happening because there's no warning. And it's an angel of God and he appears to them face to face in the middle of the dark. And I believe he, they are so terrified. And I, uh, you know, one of my favorite shows as a kid, it still is, I can watch it you know, on Saturdays uh, every, every night for about two hours. They have a two hour run of the Three Stooges. And I'm probably, y'all are thinking, yeah, we can understand why it's your favorite show. And, um, but also the little rascals. And when I think of when every time Buckwheat would get scared, his hair would just stand straight up. Do you remember? And some of the other kids as well, when they would get so terrified, their hair would stand up. And I'm thinking that that's what must have happened to the shepherds and all this hair is standing up and they're terrified. And then what does the angel say to them? And I think there is a class for every angel when they become angels. And in Angel 101, I think here's what's taught. Whenever I ask you to appear, people are going to be scared. So here's what you got to say. Learn this, memorize it, fear not. <laughs> I believe that's 101 in angel training. And God says, there, you're going to scare some people, but the first response you're going to say is fear not. And if you look in the scripture, when an angel appears, most of the time, that's their first words to these people, fear not. So that's what the, the, the shepherds are terrified. The angels say, fear not. And the angels tell them about something, the greatest present that the world has just received. And the angels are saying, won't you come and see? Won't you come and see? Look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. <laughs> For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. The root here, the good news, the root word is where we get the word gospel. And the angels are saying there is good news. It's the gospels. The angels are spreading and sharing the gospel with mankind right here. Won't you come and see. And it is sharing the gospel, not just for the shepherds, but it's sharing it for all people, for an entire world, for a universe. Now, shepherds are thought of, especially in that time, are, are very lowly people. They are not considered high in class. Not, they, they, are, they are considered lowly. They were considered dirty. Um, they, they just were not well respected. And then I think about what was David? He was a shepherd. Someone that was lowly, not well thought of, probably dirty, but God picked out. And here, the first people that the angels are sharing the gospel with is a lowly, 
dirty, least respectable people, the shepherds. And I believe that is so symbolic that what God is doing, what God is doing here is bringing his son on the scene and proving that this is just not for the elitist. This is just not for the rich. This is for everybody. The greatest present known to the world is for everybody. It's for all. It doesn't matter if you're clean or if you're dirty. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, green, red, blue, purple. It doesn't matter. It's for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're from the north, the south, the east, or the west, the United States, African countries, European countries, it doesn't matter. It's for all. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO or if you're the guy who is taking care of the grounds that the CEO manages. It doesn't matter because this great present is for everyone. Everyone. Won't you come and see the present of Jesus? Second thing is, won't you come and see the power of Jesus? Won't you come and see the power of Jesus? The shepherds, they hear specifically about Jesus' power here in the text. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, there's so much here to unpack, and we're just going to, I'm just going to kind of gloss over it just a little bit. The first thing, today in the city of David, Bethlehem. This Bethlehem, it's fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. If you heard what Trey just read, it said it's going to come from Bethlehem. It's going to come out of Bethlehem. It's where this is going to happen. So this is a fulfilling of prophecy that took care, that took place hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. And the second thing is there, there are three descriptors of Jesus there in that text. If you'll look, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Now, it would be great if just one of those things was attributed to a person. But here the angel attributes all three things to Jesus. That he is Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Won't you come see the power of Jesus there? And when the angel does that and tells them that, the angels aren't done yet. They're not done yet. Look at verse uh, 12 through 14. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's a humble setting with humble shepherds and a humble birth. And God is showing off the power of the gift, the present that he has given. There are multitudes of angels. We don't know how many. There might have been 10. There might have been thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. We don't know. It just says a multitude of them there. And they are singing praise and glorifying Jesus because he is all powerful. Did you hear what I just said? A lowly, humble scene, humble uh, shepherds, a humble birth area, humble parents, humble people there, humble shepherds, and God is showing off the power of Jesus. And he's showing it off to the world. And because of that great power, through the power of Jesus, we can be loved. Through the power of Jesus, we can be changed. Through the power of Jesus, we can be saved. Through his power, because he is Savior, he is Messiah, and he is Lord. Third thing is, won't you come and see the prestige of Jesus? Not only do we see the present of Jesus, but the power, and now we see the prestige of Jesus. What's happened is great. It is great what has just happened. Thousands of angels, all singing. We don't know how many. But what happens is the shepherds want to go and the shepherds want to see about what they just heard. 
Because guess what? Somebody talked about it. Remember what we've been saying for weeks? We got to go tell people. The angels start telling it. And they tell the shepherds. And whatever happens there, that shepherds say, hey, we got to go. Let's go see this thing. Let's go see what's happened. Let's see if this is true. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made, uh, made known to us. So they left to find just what the angels had described. They decided to be obedient and they went. They knew it was in Bethlehem. They knew there was going to be a baby in a manger, wrapped, swaddled in cloths, lying in a manger. They knew that. Now, it's not going to be in hard find in Bethlehem because Bethlehem is not what we see it today. Bethlehem really wasn't even a town. Bethlehem was more like a village. So they go there and they know, okay, we're going to find him in a manger. How many babies are we going to find in a manger? Probably not many. How many are we going to find wrapped in swaddling cloths right now? Probably not many, especially in Bethlehem, as small as it is. This might be an easy find here. So they go. And, and, and you know, most of the time we picture the scene, the manger scene is kind of looking like this. And, and, and I love this, and, and, and Robert Van Davender did a great job with just, design, you know, he just come up with this and he built it. I asked him if he could do this last year, and he did. And I love it. It's incredible. It's beautiful, the simplicity of it, and the, the simplicity of just a shelter and a manger there. But when we look at the time, we don't really know if it really kind of looked like this or not. It could have. But if we look at Bethlehem in those times, kind of a hilly country, caves, a lot of stone, things like this. This actually might have been a cave, an opening to a cave. There, the stone was, was, uh, there was plenty of it. The manger may have been something carved out of stone. We don't know, but we do know that it happened. So they go to Bethlehem and they find it. And it's just like the angel said. They find a child in a manger, swaddled in cloth. And needless to say, the shepherds hurried that way and they found that baby just like the angels of God told them. Just like they told them. Look at verse 16. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, just like the angel said. And it reminds me, the angels were on God's business, doing as they were told, given a promise that God says, go tell them this. This is a promise. And the angels went and told them, this is what you're going to find. Here's where it's going to be. Here's how you're going to find it. Go find it. The shepherds say, we're going. They went and they found it, and it's just like they said. Ain't it just like good God to keep his promises? I've never known God not to keep his promises. Anything God says, I can take and run with it because I know he's truthful and he's faithful. And the shepherds are obedient, and they go. Look at verse 17 and 18. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. As a result of this experience with Jesus, the shepherds start talking. And they started sharing their encounter. The encounter they have just had with the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? When we have an encounter with Jesus, we are to go and tell it. And as we talked about for six weeks, when we go and tell it, we're fishing for men, telling them about Jesus. Come, won't you come and see? I want to tell you about my Savior. I want to tell you about my Lord. I want to tell you about my Messiah. He is Jesus. Won't you come and see? Won't you come and see? And see, first the angels tell the shepherds, and then the angels, or they tell the shepherds, and then the shepherds start telling people, and people start talking about it. The story starts spreading, and a few years down the road, we have Jesus, the man, Jesus, the God, who is an adult, enters into his ministry, picks out his first 
followers, his first disciples, and says, come follow me. Come. Won't you come and see? I'm going to make you something you're not. I'm going to change you. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And those 12 guys start telling it, and they start living it, and knowing that because of what they saw, what they lived, who they walked with, who they lived with, who they experienced, the Jesus encounter, they couldn't keep quiet about it, even when threatened with their lives and eventually being martyred because of their belief, but they just couldn't be quiet about it. Jesus because they had encountered the Savior church Christians you've encountered by your profession of faith you've had an encounter with Jesus go and tell go and tell somebody about this Jesus that all started in a humble stable, a humble manger, a small child in a very unclean, unsanitary setting that God revealed to humble, dirty, very least thought of people to go come and see what I want you to see. And they find Jesus. And God has kept his promises again. Look at verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Everything prophesied about Jesus was coming true. Was coming true. Everything prophesied. Won't you come and see Jesus today? Won't you come and see Jesus? Will you see his prestige? Will you see his power? Will you see the present? Will you see the prestige? Who have you told about Jesus? Who have you invited to come and see? Who have you said to, won't you come and see? It's not just a baby. It's not just a rabbi. It's not just a good man. It's not just a good prophet. It's not just a good teacher. It is God the man. It is a man of God and it is God. Won't you come and see? Won't you come and see? He is worthy of all our praise. Now some of you are sitting there right now saying, well, he jumped over verse 19. No, I didn't. Go back to verse 19. Verse 19 says, But Mary <laughs> treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. That might be the understatement of the world. Because I can, Mary's world was rocked. As a teenage girl who was engaged to be married, <laughs> And an angel appears to her. And what happened? What is Mary's first response? She's scared. Angel 101, what did the angel say? Fear not. You have found favor with God. And you're going to give birth to the Messiah. And Mary, whoa, 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 wait a minute. One, I'm not married. Two, I'm a virgin. How's this going to happen? Angel says to her, Mary, <laughs> I think Angel says, you don't worry about the details. We got that worked out. But he also knew Mary was human. He said, Mary, here's how it's going to happen. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come over you. And you are going to conceive a child. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Savior. He's going to be the Lord. And Mary thought about it and said, all right. And she was just an obedient teenage girl who God had favor on. And on top of that, he says, by the way, uh, your, your cousin Elizabeth, she's six months pregnant. What? Yeah. But she can't have children. She's old. Oh, I know it, but... God's having his way. God's surprising a lot of people this season, isn't he? And Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist, goes out, starts telling people, won't you come and see? Won't you come and see? The one, I am not the Messiah. 
the one I'm telling you about, he's coming. And let me tell you, I'm not even, un, I am not worthy to untie his sandals. I'm not even worthy to put my hands on his dirty feet. But won't you come and see? The angels praised him. They told about him. They praised him. They worshiped him. And now, you can do the same. You can do the same. So today, what I want to ask you is won't you come and see? Won't you come and find Jesus? Maybe you're living a life away from Jesus. Maybe you've never entered into a relationship with him. Won't you come and see? Won't you come see the Messiah? Turn your life over to him. Let him be the Lord, Savior, and Messiah of your life. Maybe you've, you've done that. But you've been living your own way and doing your own thing. And you just realized, I, I got to go and see. I got to get my life straightened out. I got to go talk to God about that. This morning, the altar's open. If you need to find Jesus for the first time, or if you just need to come home like the prodigal son, won't you do that this morning? Will you stand? God, we pray and thank you. Bless you, honor you, praise you for your Messiah, Lord and Savior. God, I ask that if there's anyone here who's never entered into relationship with you, that today be the day that they come and see you. God, we love you so much in Jesus' name. This morning, if you've never done that, you want to do it. I'm here at the altar. You come to me, we'll talk about that. John's in the back, we'll counsel you on that. Maybe you want to join our church, become a member of our church. John and I are here for that, and we'll counsel with you on that. But this morning... Won't you come and see? All right. Hey, if you've never been with us, we're glad you're here this morning. We'd love for you to come back, uh, especially if you can bring something to eat. We love that. No, I'm just joking. We'd love to have you to come back, period. Um, I told somebody just last week that was visiting, uh, had come with family, and I said, hey, I said, we will treat you so many different ways around here, you bound to like one of them. So uh, if you just come back, you, you'll think you're a first-time guest next week because we'll treat you differently next week. And, and that's a good thing. We'll treat you gooder and gooder and gooder every week. And Miss Jacobs, our English teacher, just rolled over in her grave when I said gooder and gooder. I, <laughs> I, know, I don't know where I'm going, why I'm going to tell this. When we first moved to Tennessee 33 years ago, we went to dinner, we were visiting a church. We lived up in La Follette when we first moved here. And we went to church uh, and had been going. Our neighbor kept inviting us to church and kept talking about God. So we went to church with him, him and his family. And um, one Sunday, they were all going to go out to eat. You know, we were, we were new church members, uh, new, new church guests. And they said, we're going down to Western Sizzling to eat tonight. We want y'all to go. And I'm like, I'm all about that, if nothing else. If you've ever been to Western Sizzling, pecan pie. And uh, so we went, you know, you get in that line, and they got it all on the board, and you just order a number. And I'm, I'm standing next to a couple that went with us. First time we had met them, and she is an English teacher, and her husband is a principal. And I'm listening to what they're ordering, and he says, and there's there's one word I heard, this was the first time I'd ever heard this word in my life, and we're standing in line, and uh, he says, the principal of a school says to an English teacher, what Ewan's getting? <laughs> I said, what, what, what is Ewan's? I'd never heard that word till I moved here. <laughs> and what Ewan's getting? But her response was even better. She looked him dead in the eyes and see as she can be. I think I'm getting number nine. That's the one I like the bestest. <laughs> we got in the car after dinner and I looked at Jennifer and we didn't have children that time. I said, we have moved to the wrong place. <laughs> Miss Jacobs would kill them. That Miss Jacobs was our senior English teacher. So, and she had that pat. She always reminded me when I think about it, she's like, Pat, something she gave a stare when you did something wrong in English class. Terrified me. Me and her son were really good friends, and I'd go to her house, and I spoke the King's English when I would go to her house, and I thought, she don't speak like that. Why do you do that in front of her? It's just like 
somebody that hadn't been to church in a long time. They know they've been doing something wrong. And they come in all of a sudden, how are you thou doing, brother? And I'm like, who are you? I, 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 don't, you know, I don't know why I need to share that with you. I guess I need to talk about the fall and share my heart with you. Uh, so <laughs> remember, uh, <laughs> tithes and offerings. Uh, if you want that to be credited to you for this year, make sure you get them in by the 31st. It's okay to mail them, but they have to be postmarked by the 31st in order to get credit uh, for this year on your givings record there. There are no services this Wednesday night. Uh, so enjoy that time with your family. And we got one more week. You can bring snacks for Shannondale. Uh, we had a Christmas, kind of a Christmas party over in the youth area Wednesday night, and it just dawned on me. There was two boxes of little Debbies there, and it dawned on me. And I looked at him. I said, school's out for two weeks. These are going to go bad. I better take them. And... Uh, <laughs> So they're still over there because somebody knew my, I was hatching a plan over there. So, hey, so uh, I really want us to get to our goal, but um, don't feel pushed. I'm not, you know, uh, orange burns the skin. And, uh, but if y'all do that, I'm, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. Uh, the only thing that can be worse than that, 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 that uh, I draw the line. If y'all were to say, we'll make you wear an Auburn shirt, I'll quit. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> I will walk out today and not ever come back if you make me wear an Auburn shirt. Uh, so, uh,